during the 1940s, a seemingly innocuous study into the absorption of iron in pregnant women was carried out at the Vanderbilt University. Little did the 751 participants know, nor were they told, that they were consuming not a vitamin drink, but a radioactive isotope, equivalent to the radiation one is exposed to during an X-ray. Even during the subsequent study researching the absorption of radioactive material, the women were not informed. At least three children were known to have died as a result of the study, all from various forms of cancer. And yet, the dangers of radiation and their potential for harm ought to have been known, perhaps best seen in the fate of the so-called radium girls. In today's video, we will discuss the Vanderbilt University experiment, just how such a dangerous study was carried out, and any lessons that could have been learned from the radium girls. 751 pregnant women, mainly from low economic backgrounds, sought healthcare at the Vanderbilt University Parental Free Clinic. However, the treatment given was not at all what was expected. The researchers were looking to study how iron is absorbed in pregnant women as means to work out nutritional guidelines. The women, therefore, were given iron-rich vitamin drinks by the researchers as part of their treatment. In order to track how much iron was absorbed, radioactive iron was used so that it could be easily detected in the women and fetuses. The effect of consuming this radioactive material was exposure to radiation 30 times higher than natural radiation, or about the same as being x-rayed. In a follow-up study in the 1960s, the researchers sought to contact as many of the women who consumed the radioactive iron. They were able to contact 90% of the original unwitting participants, and compared the instances of malignancy with a random group of other clinic patients. When the consequences of their mother's exposure to the radioactive material was analysed, it was noted that there was a significant increase in cancers in these children. It was noted that four of the children had died from cancers. One of the deaths was attributed to a rare form of cancer unrelated to radiation. The three other deaths were a statistical anomaly and were directly linked to the mother's consumption of the iron. One of the victims, Caroline Kraft, was only 11 years old when she died, along with a young boy who died of lymphatic leukemia at the age of just five. No such malignancies were found in the comparison group. In a disturbing turn of events, the mothers were not informed of the follow-up study about their involuntary exposure, even when it was clear that there was a disproportionately high incidence of cancer as a result. It wasn't until 1998 that a legal battle was settled and that participants and their families were entitled to around $10 million in compensation. The courts rejected any defence claims made by the university that too much time had passed and that the matter should be time barred. The courts instead asserted that what was done to the women did not constitute medical care. And because the women were not fully informed and information was withheld, how much time had passed was irrelevant. You may think that this was a one-off example of using radioactive material in human experiments, but this is far from the truth. Much of what we know about the experiments conducted only came to light in the 1990s when United States President Bill Clinton ordered documents held on such studies to be made publicly available. A special committee produced a report in 1995 which stated that wrongs were committed. In a very interesting coincidence, the report was released on the 3rd of October 1995, which just so happened to be the same day as the verdict in the O.J. Simpson case, meaning it received little in the way of media attention. Some of the examples of research undertaken included a number of disabled children being fed cereal containing radioactive iron and calcium. With funding from Quaker Oats, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology carried out an experiment similar to the Vanderbilt study. The goal was to track the absorption of nutrients in Quaker Oats throughout the body, using the radioactive material to track where it was being absorbed. Whilst there were no reported casualties, again the children were not able to give informed consent, and again, vulnerable people were selected as the participants, with the truth withheld. You may think that we were unaware of the dangers of radiation at the time such experiments were conducted. However, you would be mistaken. 
Whilst it was thought the initial dosage was safe, it soon became apparent in the follow-up studies that there was a dangerous link, and yet the cover-up persisted. The effects of radiation have been noted since the late 1800s. It was first observed that X-rays could cause burns, though the damage was attributed to the creation of ozone produced as a byproduct. Pierre and Marie Curie's research into polonium and identification radium, in particular for its use in dealing with cancers, was a major breakthrough. The genetic effects of radiation were discovered by American doctor Herman Joseph Muller. He identified a definitive correlation between exposure to radiation, such as X-rays, and lethal mutations. Muller pushed the dangers of radiation exposure in humans, stating the risk associated with doctors operating X-ray machines, and more surprisingly to shoe shop owners, who offered an X-ray foot measuring service. Muller would go on to win a Nobel Prize for his work in 1946, just two years before the start of the Vanderbilt study. But perhaps the most infamous of examples of the dangers of radioactive material can be found in the cases of the so-called radium girls. The material discovered by the Curies was seen as a wonder substance. Useful not in just treating cancers, but having applications in jewellery, an additive in toothpaste, and on clocks and dials, due to its luminous and supposed regenerative qualities. With the advent of World War I, a demand arose for luminous control panels, watches, and all manner of dials. Such dials, if painted with radium-infused paint, would make them far easier to see in the dark. And so, from 1917, factories began hiring women to paint the dials with undark. A radium-infused paint produced by the Radium Luminous Material Corporation. Those involved, however, were completely unaware of the radioactive properties of radium and the damage it could inflict. As the job required precision painting of the dials, the employees were told to lick the radium-coated paintbrushes to a tip. The phrase that directed the workflow was, lip, dip, paint, and repeat. But with the radium craze gripping the nations, the women would also apply the radium paint to their nails and even their teeth believing it would provide a health benefit. Three factories were built in the late 1910s and early 1920s, affecting dozens of women. It did not take long for the problems to arise. The damage was first noticed by dentists. The dial painters reported problems such as loose teeth, mouth ulcers, and bleeding and unhealthy gums. Jaw pain, brittle bones, and even necrosis of the jaw soon followed. It was in 1923 that the first dial painter died, with some truly disturbing injuries, including her jaw falling away from her face. The deaths and debilitating illnesses affecting the dial painters soon came thick and fast, though were initially dismissed as syphilis. The radium companies sought to obfuscate the truth, hiding the growing data compiled by doctors and dentists about the ever-growing numbers of afflicted. The man who invented the radium dial paint, Dr. Sabin von Sochocki, also died in November of 1928, being the 16th person to die following exposure to his paint. His death helped form the court case brought by a number of the women who were dying from exposure to the radium. Despite attempts by the defendants to delay the court process and wait for the workers to die, some managed to live long enough and succeeded in reaching an out-of-court settlement in 1928. But for many more of the employees, the court cases would last well into the 1930s, the radium company losing in court multiple times before paying out compensation. It should be noted that during the late 1920s, the radium company carried out its own investigation into its employees' health, withholding the results. It was even the case that a number of executives would wear protective equipment when going anywhere near the material, something denied to their workers. For both the women of radium workers and the Vanderbilt experiment, the dangers of consuming radioactive material was far from their mind. Both believed what they were consuming was for their benefit, either a vitamin or the new wonder substance of radium. Both were denied access to the truth as to the dangers. But for the radium girls, it was not known as to the dangers until it was too late. For the hundreds of pregnant women surreptitiously given radioactive iron and not told as to the well-known risks, there is another level of disregard for their safety and for the safety of the fetuses. 
Whilst our understanding is only ever expanding, we ought to be mindful of what precautions need to be taken. It should never be the case that our understanding grows through secret experiments on unwitting people.